Pleasure to meet uh, you, Tom. It's nice to meet you, John. I've loved, loved your videos. So let's plug those real quick. Everybody who's listening, Dr. John <clears throat> is a cognitive scientist, and he has an entire YouTube. And I will post that in the chat here in just a moment. Please go watch his series on the meaning crisis and a new series that he's doing after Socrates, which we will talk about probably today. Um, I, I loved the meaning crisis. I think I got to episode, oh, I don't know, the, the 20 something. I could, I didn't make it through all 50. It's it just, I would forget, I would get onto something else and then I would forget to go back and I'll get on something else. Yeah. I, I watched the first episode of After Socrates. Brilliant. Just brilliant stuff, man. Um, what are you doing in your life right now? Is that your main focus? Is the After Socrates thing? Or are you, have you got other things going on that you really enjoy? After Socrates is done for me. Like they say, everything's in the can and they're just, uh, there'll be 25 episodes in total. Um, I've been working on a, a few projects. I worked the last sort of month or so, I've been working on a video essay on uh, AI, the new emerging AI and what are the scientific and philosophical and spiritual uh, issues surrounding that. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, and I also, I mean, I'm a full-time <laughs> professor at the University of Toronto, so I, and I'm a director of the CogSci program, so I'm doing all of that as well. I would die to be in one of your classes. <laughs> I know that sounds a little yeah. fanboyish, but I would love, I requested to interview you because I love your material. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I think you have such a view on it that no one else does. I think you're a bit, a bit revolutionary in this case to, to question meaning and uh, what, you know, all the forms of nihilism and all the forms of absurdism, you know, what can we do against these things? Um, do you, well, I have, I could break this down and ask you the questions that I have, but I don't want to read off a script. I'd rather us just have a convo. Um, Great. I prefer that. Yeah, too. I like that better. I figured you would too. Um, let's talk about after Socrates. Can we tell the people in your words what you're trying to do there? Yeah. Um, so Awakening from the Meaning Crisis was very much uh, uh, an investigation, both historical and scientific, into what is this thing we're talking about? We're talking about meaning in life. Why is it so important? How is it wrapped up with wisdom? How is it wrapped up with uh, the sense of the sacred, self-transcendence? Um, but after I, I, I was done that, many people uh, said, yeah, but what do I do now? Right? What do I do? Um, and I'd already been teaching uh, a bunch of uh, practices. During COVID, I did an everyday online uh, course on meditation, contemplation, the cultivation of wisdom. and. And so what I thought I'd do is um, I, I wanted to put together a course uh, that laid out a particular path uh, by which one could aspire to cultivate wisdom. Um, and uh, for me, the, the, that path was a Socratic path following uh, Socrates and the Neoplatonic tradition. So the series is, there's a lecture series like Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And then there's also, I do a, a bit where I, I, I refer people to points they can bring into discussion groups. And then third, I teach practices, and the, and so there's a there's an ecology of practices that builds. There's ongoing points for discussion, so hopefully discussion groups will build. And then there's the ongoing lecture yeah. series that gives people an understanding. So it's yeah, very much part of you know. Pardon me, I, sorry, I was. Oh, I'm sorry, I just cut you, cut you off there. I was just saying like a butterfly effect, yeah. Yeah, very much. And so the idea there is to try and uh, create for people. Um, an integrated way uh, that is nevertheless uh, philosophically and I think uh, scientifically uh, respectable, legitimate, uh, an integrated way of pursuing enhanced meaning, reduced foolishness, uh, greater sense of virtue and wisdom in their life. And also to make wisdom something, well, something towards which we should have proper reverence, not something that has a mystique around it, but something mm -hmm. that is makes no, 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 this is what I can start doing today, right now to start. And it's not some, I don't have to be like, you know, an old man sitting on a mountain. Wisdom is about overcoming self-deception, increasing connectedness, cultivating virtue, appreciating why you should, etc. cetera. Um, so um, that's what I want for people. I really want to help uh, wake people up uh, from, as you said, the, the, the absurdism, the nihilism, 
uh, 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 the cynicism, uh, that the darkness that has become so pervasive in the culture. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think that's a little bit of growing pains with the internet. What do you think about that? Well, that's interesting because one of the things I've been trying to do is, um, um, well, let, let, let me say, first of all, um, when I was proposing that I would do the uh, awakening for the meeting crisis, you know, and it, oh, people won't do it. They won't hang in for an hour lecture. And, and yes, they will. Like, yeah. And so <laughs> that's what I found out. Um, and then I started more and more wanting to experiment with the medium, what, what could be done with it. That's why I'm doing, you know, these multiple different things on YouTube uh, with After Socrates. It's why I, I have a bunch of different, like I have that series but I also have um, Voices with Raveki, which I do something very much like this, right? And people that I think um, have something um, challenging and or convergent to say uh, uh, to what I'm talking about. I, I get into these kinds of flowing discussions with them. And then I also have uh, a playlist called The Cognitive Science Show, where I do a bunch of shows, usually with Greg Enriquez and other academics. And what we do is we try to show that ideas aren't generated by the polished professor giving the monologue. They're actually generated by people really like in, in a group doing this, you know, what I call distributed cognition, playing off against each other, sparking each other, pushing. Like a, like a social constructivism of intersubjectivity kind of thing, right? Yes, but where that, in, where that intersubjectivity isn't pursued just for its own sake, but pursued for how, uh, how can we better conform and align ourselves to the contours, the ligaments of reality, so we can better understand it in a scientific manner. I'm working on a new one right right now, actually, with Greg. Oh, well, real quick, where were the other things that you just mentioned all of that? Where are those other things available to see? They're in a playlist on my channel called The Cognitive Science Show. So the, okay. there's, there's three basic kinds of things you'll find on my channel. You'll find these extended lecture series or one-off essays video essays you'll mm -hmm. find the voices worth for Vakey, which is this kind of these dialogical thing yeah and yeah. then the cognitive science show is where you're seeing right the actual way in which scientific ideas are generated now for me it's cognitive science um and like i say greg and i are working uh, uh another one right now excellent I love your work, um, and it is all on YouTube. It will, or it will be all that's on YouTube. Most of it is also now on uh, podcasts as well. Some of the major podcast channels, um, okay. Spotify, Apple, etc. Um, yeah, and of course, um, for those who uh, who want to, there are times when I'm speaking at conferences, and that's when it's live. And uh, so that's also I, I would love to come see you live and shake your hand. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so why, why not after Parmenides or after Zeno? Why after Socrates? Let's get into Excellent that. Excellent question. Uh, so for me, um, Socrates, I mean, many people, not just me, many people have called it the Socratic revolution. Socrates brings about a change in uh, philosophy that's pivotal. Um, and I think therefore makes it still uh, relevant today. Now, I'm not uh, and if you watch the series, I'm very clear. I don't suggest we we try to replicate Socrates or that we should follow everything he says slavishly or anything like that. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a process by which you internalize the sage, the way an athlete learns to internalize a coach. He doesn't do everything the coach says, right? And and you not just but you, but you internalize the coach because that helps in a profound way. The geist of the coach, right? <laughs> yeah, the geist of the coach. Well said. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Socrates, I mean, Socrates, he picks up, I mean, I mean, a good way to think about it, and I talk about this in both Awakening from the Meaning Crisis and after Socrates, is Socrates is, he's definitely influenced by the natural philosophers who preceded him, uh, like Anaximander, Heraclitus, and people like that. He's definitely yeah. uh, influenced probably by Parmenides through Zeno, maybe. It, I, I think it's plausible. Um, anyway, but he's also influenced... But what he, what, what he struggles with with them is he admires, I think, their pursuit of the truth and trying to get in contact with reality, but he doesn't see how what they're doing transforms individuals, leads them to lead good lives. He sees that it's, it's kind of like, you know, you read Einstein, he goes, this is a brilliant theory of relativity, but how does that make any difference to how I treat my partner better <laughs> or something like that? It's, it's right? It's right. Um, and then he he go he also was deeply influenced by the sophists who had invented rhetoric and had learned how to make 
things really accessible and really catchy, but at the expense of caring about the truth. And so he rejects both groups and he looks for, I want, I want, I want a kind of truth that is transformative of human beings. I want to find that kind of truth that doesn't just that my life touches. And so in a very real sense, he, he makes, makes philosophy and, you know, and in some ways people call him the first existential hero. He makes, uh, he makes philosophy existential, which means also, and that's the reason why to follow him, he doesn't just talk about it. He exemplifies it. He lives it out. He's willing to literally die for it, uh, which means that we should take it seriously. And he was able to inspire many people, Xenophon and others, but most importantly, this utterly brilliant individual called Plato. And that, <laughs> is, that is worth taking note of. Yeah. I love how some people will say, um, historically, just based on canonical, you know, the text and stuff, that Plato made up Socrates. And uh, we have other references, of course, for Socrates existing. So I think yeah. that he existed. But it's just a funny little thing that some people say, well, Plato was the real genius because he concocted Socrates. Um, I, all of that is so brilliant. I mean, I always think about the dialectic began with him. I think of the fact of the story with him and Mino about yes. justified true belief and epistemology. Yes. Um, I think he started everything, everything that you said, obviously. Um, what his method, and that's kind of what we're doing here in this discussion community, this Pangburn hang. If you ever have time, I'm a busy guy, but um, we like the dialectic. We, we, mm. we try to be Socratean. You know what I mean? Um, so, well, so well that's, what, that's what After Socrates is about. The stated goal of After Socrates is to do an in-depth investigation, historically, philosophically, and in practice, so as to reverse engineer dialectic into dialogos. What is platonic dialectic? How does it lead you properly into dialogos? Uh, what does that mean? What does it uh, what are the practices that help support it? Because actually you can't do dialogos. You can, it's like building a fire. You can get all the conditions right, but the spark has to catch for itself. Right, or, yes. Or it's not dialogos. And so that's exactly what I'm, that's, if you if you had to put it in the elevator pitch, it's like if you think uh, platonic dialectic uh, and dialogical rationality as opposed to monological rationality is mm. really, really needed right now, then we need to learn how to reverse engineer it so that we can reliably practice it uh, with each other so that we can, as you said, how can we get a group of people to be to become together in the we space, a Socrates for each member who is participating in the group? what we typically do, which is the museum tour of the theories. God, um, yes. Oh, yeah. man. So what you need is you need, no, no, no. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't mean to be just sort of being self-promotional, but you need to give people this really well-crafted integration of theory the affordance of discussion and practice, both individual and group practice, in order for, you know, this, this, is, this is something in Socrates, it's something in the Stoics, right? Philosophy is the love of wisdom, which is not primarily carried out through discourse. Discourse is important, but it's in the service of, right, the cultivation of wisdom, connectedness, mm -hmm. virtue. And so, um, now, I, I, I can't, you know that I am working with people to try and figure out Again, not just in some policy paper, but in practice, and you know, doing workshops to test things out, how to bring this kind of stuff into um, uh, high, upper levels of high school, uh, university, yes. etc. Very yes. much, it's a project I'm actively in, uh, involved in. That's so awesome because that's kind of what I mean. I think that kind of be, having literacy like that at age 16, 17, 18. I mean, is just going to prepare you for seeking that wisdom. I mean, it's okay. Let me jump on it. <laughs> Plato talked about you have to be seduced 
into philosophy. You, like, I can, if I if if there's nothing, I have to call you by what something beautiful and maybe something poetic, maybe something artistic, and then a practice that I'll, I'll open you. Like, you have to be called into it, just like you you know, you you have to be drawn into a friendship. You can't just walk up to somebody and say, you know, today from today on, you and I just met. We're going to be friends. Right? <laughs> that doesn't work, right? You have to be drawn into it, and. We confuse presenting people with information with affording them the possibility of transformation. And this is one of the besetting things that we've lost in um, the, our education. I, I understand we, we mean to do all the stuff we do. We have to prepare people for making a living and, and, and so forth and so on. But we have to remember that education is primarily, and this is Zach Stein's idea, it's, it's intergenerational. Right? It's about how one generation affords the other generation the best possibility of a good life, not just making a good living. And those yes. are not the same thing. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, yes. Um, th there is really no other answer. I mean, you, you, can, you could make, like, philosophy courses and um, psychology courses necessary. big fight to get that into the high schools you know what i mean and yeah I would be part of it with you well there's a, a bunch of people i'm trying to work with um some people that a good friend of mine johannes niederhauser he basically gave up trying to do what he considers philosophy which is exactly what we're talking about right here right now the love, love wisdom that transforms lives mm -hmm. right in academic philosophy i still think there's value in academic philosophy but i understand his critique, and so he set up Halkian University, where you basically you can go online, and you can take courses in this manner about Hegel or Nishitani's religion and nothingness, right? And you can, and and so it's and and, and it's it's just oh, it's this. I mean, you have there's discipline. You have to read. You have to come prepared, but it's 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 not about any all of this machinery. And man, have I seen it grow in. The university, the bureaucratic machinery, and all the other stuff that um, and oh, Helkin, yeah. Helkin and other places are just free from that, and you just get in there and you just do the wrestling. Um, and so I really admire him for that. I'm going to be doing a course for him this year, actually. I think they need also need to teach uh, younger children how to communicate. With increasing sets of rules, which is a doomed project. Um, after a certain, I mean, you, it's doomed in the sense of diminishing returns. Initially, it makes a huge difference, and then more and more rules make very small differences. Um, what you need to, need to be doing is, you know, teaching kids principles of nonviolent, but but seriously mutually challenging uh, communication. Uh, yes. And, and that, like, and you can teach that like a martial art. And since a lot of the books are like verbal Okido, verbal judo, and you can, and you, yeah, I think people need to have a background in that, um, and then, um, and then you can slowly work them in. You can introduce them. Exact. That's what I was going to say. That exact thing. You could slowly work them into seeing, hey, how you have conversations or even debates with people fits directly into philosophy and psychology. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yes. That's yeah, exactly. And, right. Exactly. And I'm obsessed with the cognitive sciences, just like you. This has been my whole life. You know, uh, I got a computer science degree and, and wasted that because I'm interested in all these things. Um, let's let's jump back real quick. Let's change it up. Let's go back to the meaning crisis. And uh, I want you to explain psychotechnologies to me. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 and you have to remember, like, like the technology, the use of techne, which is usually um, uh, this is a, a kind of is not like it, it's not it's what Wittgenstein called a family resemblance. Yes, right? exactly. What's a, what's a tool and what's so if you, I want the hard line definite. I can't give it to you because you can't give it to me for what a tool is. But no. just like just like a physical tool. So here's my water bottle, right? And uh, it's designed to fit my biology and enhance it. I can carry way more by carrying the bottle. I can carry way more water than I could carry in my hand. So technology fits to you, 
and enhances, and it relies on what's standardized. Like notice this bottle will fit many people. It's not a John specific bottle, which no. would be a very, very expensive thing. And, and probably the increase in use that I would get for it being so specific would be very minuscule for the cost. Yeah. So think about uh, ways in which we can uh, organize the, the formatting and the communication of information that are standardized to fit sort of standardized principles of cognition and then enhance it. So an example of that is literacy. Nobody is naturally literate. People are naturally linguistic. That means they'll... So you believe in the generative grammar model? Uh, the, um, uh, the I don't... I, I, I'm not... I, in the, if you'd asked me in 1997 when I published on this, I would have said yes. I don't think the Chomsky model is sufficient. I think Chomsky's arguments have still have to be addressed. But I think the work of Tomasello and others showing in between presumably innate constraints and important um, constraints and processes within social distributed cognition that contribute to language learning, I think all of that has to be. So you taken. think there's a social constructivism to cognition? Um, to certain aspects of cognition, yeah, for sure. Um, for, mm. Let me give you one that I think is relatively uncontroversial, and nevertheless important. And we'll come back to psychotech. Yeah, take your time. I'm loving this. So you are a metacognitive being. You can step back and reflect on your own perspective. You can step back and become aware of what you... I can ask you, what are you doing right now in your mind? What are you thinking? You can tell me. Now, if you ask a three or almost even a four-year-old what's going on in your head, they'll tell you blood, right? They can't do that. They can't, they can't do that introspection. In fact, I kept I, uh, I kept track of when my, my younger son first gave me clear signs of introspection and some metacognition. And these were the two and they were quite precious for me. And he was just had turned four. Just That's why it's the friendly fours, right? Um, yeah. and he, we're driving along in the car and said, Daddy, it's snowing outside, but only in my head. Oh, oh that's, that's cute. Really cool. That's yeah. He could do oh, what's called yeah. mental time travel, episodic memory. He yeah. could do that. But here's a here's a nice addendum. I asked him, "Does everyone else have one?" And he said, "No, only me." <laughs> only me. He's a solipsist. Oh no. So that metacognition is learned. You don't come with it, and this is the way you you most plausibly learn it. I start to so I have a certain perspective. Let's say I'm a kid, and you're the adult helping me. You have a perspective not only on the problem that we share, but you have a perspective on my perspective. And I imitate yes, you. Meta, meta, yeah, meta perspective. Yes, you're right. Yes. And by imitating you, I get the skill of taking a perspective on my own perspective, and then I don't need you anymore. And that's metacognition. Is that so I think ah. that is very much socially constructed. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely inner subjectivity learning from that interaction, you know, that interpersonal interaction, and like reflecting it. It's like I mean, like this nonlinear way. It's it's that's really cool to think about. Um, well, let's keep going. Let's start, um, you explain psychotechnologies extremely well. I it, it's because I studied for you when we when we had the mix up last time, and I forgot some of the meaning crisis episodes. Okay, I was, okay, was going to ask you some questions. Uh, I had them written down, but I don't have. Well, can uh, I just finish the point about psychotech? Because I don't I don't think absolutely. Quite... Please, I didn't even know you were done. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Please don't apologize. We're, I'm enjoying speaking. this so much. Yeah, uh, yeah. So literacy is socially constructed. That's no question. Human beings, uh, for most of our history, we were illiterate. And there's still, unfortunately, large parts of the world where people are illiterate. So, but what does literacy do? So it's standardized to fit, right? The way we see and, and so, and, and the way we can write, right? And, and, and the way we can store certain kinds of graphic information. It's all standardized to fit us really well. But look what look what literacy does, how it empowers you. So with literacy, I can write my thoughts down and come back to them later. And so they're, la they're not as ephemeral as they used to be. I can reflect on them. I can correct them over time. I can, I can actually stitch different instances of John Verveke together thinking about a problem. I can also use it to communicate with people all over the place in a synchronous fashion and get all of them 
to help work on John's thinking and what John is thinking about. And so yeah. I, I can massive. So think about what would happen to you if I removed literacy from your cognition. It the would change your personality. It, it would, would change, change you so are. much. Yes, yeah. that's a psychotechnology and that's a power of a psychotechnology. Mm. Being able to write it down also in chronological order to remember the identity that you were and no longer are. Exactly so when he was writing Moby Dick, it's just sort of something oh. to form a part. Um, yeah. Do you know a lot about that novel? Yeah, I taught. I, I was an academic okay. chair for a private high school, and I taught Moby Dick for a few years. Actually, what, tell me, tell me the most interesting motif or metaphor in that story. Do you... The most interesting is it like it's not. I mean, I have only read pieces of Moby Dick in high school. I I did not read the whole thing, but I've I've always seen it portrayed in t television and all these kind of things, right? From Hell's Heart, I stabbeth thee, that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Um, Here, what gonna, is, gonna, uh, is, is I'm it just madness else. overcoming? I'm sorry. I'm going to do something else. So a very good friend of mine, Christopher Pietro, gave me this card and he put it at my favorite passage from Moby Dick and I'm going to read it. It's not very long. Uh, by the way, look at what the card does. It's really cool. Really e sure. Even if it is. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Even if it is long, read the whole thing. We don't care. Okay. But. So this is, this is Ishmael looking at a, a, a character called Bulkington, who doesn't loom that large, but there's this really interesting thing going on here. I just want, this passage gives you a feel for what, what's going on in Moby Dick. But as in, landless, as, but as in landlessness alone resides the highest truth, shoreless, indefinite as God, so better it is to perish in that howling infinite than be ingloriously dashed upon the lee even if that were safety. For worm-like then, oh, who would crave and crawl to land? Terrors of the terrible, is all this agony so vain? Take heart, take heart, O Bulkington, bear thee grimly, demigod. Up from the spray of thy ocean perishing, straight up leaps thy apotheosis. Mm -hmm. So what he's trying to get at, he's got this metaphor that there's a ship and there's a storm and if the ship gives in to the temptation to go home to the safety of port, it will actually be dashed against the rocks. So instead, what it needs to do is turn out towards the open ocean and the open horizon and sail into that infinite howling and be actually powered by the very storm in order to get to come to the, the, the proper kind of safety that it can achieve. That's excellent. I see. And that... Uh... <laughs> One of our friends in chat says Moby Dick is an allegory about the U.S. Uh, we I don't know if we have that much time. Um, <laughs> uh, no, that's that's a brilliant take on it, and I just thought it would be interesting for the audience to see your your take on that since you have taught it. Um, let's go back into uh, wait. Now you said you said you're doing something after after Socrates way, but. No, I, I mean, I, I, so we're, we're working on the third big series. Um, so I'll be working on prepping the series this year, sort of ju this July to next July. And then I go on sabbatical and we're going to actually film this series. Uh, so, uh, we don't know what the title is. It's something like uh, Walking the Silk Road of Zen Neoplatonism. And what I want to do... It's, it's searching for the God beyond God. It's searching for what's the, the sense of the sacred in non-dual, non-theism, and trying to show the two histories. One is the history of the sort of Neoplatonic tradition in the West and find pivotal figures, you know, like maybe Tillich or Plotinus, and actually go to these places. And actually, right, I want to, get, I want to pick up on what I call the geophilosophy, right? Like, uh, sit, actually be situated in the, embedded in the culture, like, and I want this to be, I want this to be demanding on me. I want this to be a transformative journey. I'm going to travel and try and travel as much as I can, political reasons, I can't do the whole thing, the Silk Road and, and go from sort of Neoplatonism in the West, which is the great synthesis. It's the great grand unified field theory of Western philosophy and Buddhism 
uh, in, 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 in all those Dharmic religions. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. And then, uh, and and there's a lot of people, especially. like the Kyoto School uh, in Japan that were already trying to build this bridge and then try and, in a sense, uh, suffer through in the sense of undergoing the transformation of uh, what it would be like to put these two into deep Socratic dialogue, dialogos, dialectic mm -hmm. with each other, a proper mm -hmm. opponent processing. So we'd have Zen Neoplatonism. Um, and of course, there's lots of bridges also in the West. There's been people in the West for a few decades trying to build what they call Zen Christianity, uh, largely building on the Neoplatonism within Christianity. And, and what I want to try and do is, Thomas Plant has this beautiful book where he's doing it. He's integrating Dionysus's um, Christian Neoplatonism uh, with aspects of Buddhism uh, called, oh, what's it called? Uh, lost Knowledge uh, or The Lost Way. Uh, I, I, I apologize, Thomas Plant. Uh, no, it's okay. But anyway, the Silk Road, integrated East and West together. And it, what you had on it was something like this Neoplatonism and, and, and Proto-Zen, right? And it's not that everybody in, they could all meet and talk deeply and mutually transformative. Uh, with each other as a, and it stitched the East and the West together in a yeah. profound philosophical, spiritual um, reality. I'd like to try and propose that that is possible for us now. And I want to try and undergo it. I want to, I'm not going to propose something that I myself don't try to undergo. Yeah. The idea is to go there, to film it, uh, to film, uh, make use of um, the location, the culture, everything I can along the way. Oh, that's that's the next big series. I think that's going to be awesome. You're going to get to travel the world. You're going to get to take in these cultures. You're going to get to understand how Neoplatonism basically formed everything religious for a long time after it. Um, uh, and then you're going to get to look into like Zoroastrianism and Monarchianism and like some of the very earliest forms of like good and evil religions, things like that. It depends. I mean, uh, I mean, I really want to get. I would love to be able to go to Iran and do, you know, especially Suravardi, right, and his philosophy of illumination, uh, which you know, integrates uh, aspects of Sufism and uh, Neoplatonism. Reciprocally reconstruct each other. We get Christian uh, Neoplatonism. Uh, uh, Islam and Neoplatonism can do this and you, know, you get Sufism and Judaism. Is, and is that like because because Neoplatonism is, is saying we return to the one that that is so connected to these other? I, th I think, I mean, some a, a couple of the recent arguments I've given um, on my channel are arguing that <clears throat> Neoplatonism is, is it, I mean, we have to revise it. We can't just go back to what it was. Uh, so it's sort of a post-nominalist Neoplatonism. Oh, so, okay. Okay, so, so no, no, no platonic idealism, right? A kind of idealism, but not... Um, the realm of forms. Well, what I mean by that is I think the mainstream, I, I belong to what uh, is called third way platonic scholarship that rejects right? Uh, 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 the sort of standard, uh, you know, first year university presentation of Plato's theory of the forms. And I've actually been trying to articulate how we can rehabilitate that notion in light of recent cognitive science. That's what I've done in a couple of my most recent talks, at the presentations at conferences. Um, and these have been received very well. And it's convergent with I think Neoplatonism offers a very powerful, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced it's plausibly true, but it offers a very powerful way to integrate spirituality and science back together again. And, and that's the other thing Neoplatonism has entered into reciprocal reconstruction with science. You know, you can see it at work 
in, in you know the Renaissance and helping to give birth to the scientific. Well, I mean, the standard model, the standard model of particle physics wants to return to the one. Yes, I, I, I think I, I think <laughs> I think that's right, and I think I, I, I can only gesture at these arguments when I ask for forbearance because I make these arguments in much more detail with a lot more rigor. Oh, I know you do. God help us, you make this in a lot. The meaning crisis is so well explained; it's it's ridiculous. You can get. Everybody who's listening, I'm going to plug you again. Please go listen to The Meaning Crisis. It is fantastic. I haven't gotten through uh, after Socrates all the way through, but now I'm excited for a new one. So I'm going to have to put some time aside for that. Um, Just real quick, I'm not changing us too far off subject. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is there a neo-neoplatonism right now? I think so. And I think part of that neoplatonism is I'm proposing is it needs to be global in a way that wasn't quite, or at least the way it was global when it, the Silk, the first Silk Road existed, um, and so Zen also has that enormous capacity with a lot of different things, um, yeah. and I think these two could do sort of, you know, hyper reciprocal reconstruction with each other and mutual self-correction and self-inducing. So why should they be separated, basically? Yeah, but and 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 instead of like, what what have we what have we from the beginning built? Uh, opponent processing, not adversarial conflict, but opponent processing into our spiritual our spiritual framework, such that it was constantly capable of profound self correction. Um, mm. That yeah, yeah, that's that's I, I think this is the possibility. Now, I'm not founding a new religion, nor am I, I am I saying this is the way. What I'm saying, I'm trying to say, this is. If, if, if this doesn't sound too coin, I don't mean to be, but this is the way to the way, right? This is the way to in which we can take what we have from the past, exact it, give it sort of this living self-corrective ability, make it global, make it intercultural, really first, like deeply intercultural um, and cross-cultural. There's a lot of good work going on in cross-cultural philosophy right now. We can make use of that in this project. And then that would hopefully put us in a place where we could and it has to be we. The next Buddha is the Sangha, where we could give birth to what is needed. It connect, oh, it's, it's, it, and it's not only quantitatively, it's qualitatively, right? So notice, notice what's weird here. We've got the immediacy of speech, but we've got the permanency of writing because we're recording this. So the boundary between speech and writing has gone down. Is this a private or a public conversation? Both and neither, right? And so we've got many of the ways, many of sort of the fundamental grammar of how we parse things out, of how we connect and communicate, are being superseded by these media in really important, powerful ways. Now, largely that has been exploited by people who don't care about us uh, for their own political and economic gain. But more and more, we could right? Exploit that for us. Yes. Uh, benefit us. As long as we maintain that free speech on the internet, I think what you're talking about, these these uh, intersections of, of Zen and Neoplatonism and all this kind of stuff, I don't see a line blurring a lot of it a hundred years down the road. You know what I mean? Um, what do you think? What do you think the nature of spirituality in the empirical method is going to be in 50 years. The essay I recent, the video essay I released on uh, AI, um, especially the GPT machines and what they mean, what they mean scientifically, what they mean philosophically, what they mean spiritually. I think These machines, and this is something that's part of third way Platonism, um, which sees that the point of the Socratic dialogues is not to come to any propositional conclusion, but to awaken in you what, I, what I've talked about is other kinds of knowing, the non-propositional knowing, uh, the procedural, the perspectival, and the participatory. Um, this is why many of the Platonic dialogues propositionally end in aporia. They end out, they end with no propositional conclusion, but they usually end with people having changed their relationship to Socrates 
either they realize I need to be near Socrates a lot more or they run away because they're afraid of what they've realized is possible for themselves existentially. The Socratic uh, so, method is scary. Yeah, in fact, I would go so far as to say there isn't a method. There's a lot of books that argue about this. There's a whole anthology that Socrates have a method. Um, I think Socrates has a way, and and this is, and I'm using it like Taoist, the Taoist sense of way. Right, like a like, yes, yes, the Tao. Into it, they have to catch the Tao of it. Uh, which is very, very interesting. Did he think that the uh, the, the Socratic dialogue was like an ontology? Logical existence between the two people? Or was it, I don't, oh, guess, yes. I don't know if he was going, he did? Okay. I, I think very much. I think, I think, uh, you know, because so, uh, you know, I, that's I, very I, Hegelian. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, one of the projects I'm involved with with my good friend Dan Schiappi, and we, we've collaborated on several papers together. We're working on a book on uh, the, the, the the being of reason and the reason of being. Um, and one of the projects I'm involved in is trying to integrate these dialectics together: the vertical Platonic dialectic, the Hegelian horizontal dialectic, the prospective and retrospective dialectic, um, Nishitani's dialectic, which is uh, the dialectic between being and not non-being existentially, not just conceptually. It sounds like Heidegger a little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, well, he, uh, Heidegger is a big influence on Nishitani, but uh, Religion okay. and Nothingness is one of the top five books I've read in my life. I read it, studied it, read it twice kind of thing. Um, but yeah, and, and and then also Adorno's uh, negative dialectics, where he's trying to talk about the dialectic between prop, the propositional and the non-propositional. And these, they, they're not totally distinct from each other. They overlap, in it, and I'm trying to get clear, and this is very much a work in progress, about how do they all relate together. Now, here's what I wanted to say. I think that are properly ineffable, and there's a lot of good work being done on ineffability. I mean, philosophically astute work. Um, um, that because they're non-propositional, because they're procedural, they're perspectival and participatory, I think more and more, even though they, this is already part of the past, but more and more we are going to emphasize those. Uh, we will emphasize the ineffable spirit of our self-transcendence, and we will emphasize the embodied ineffability of our soul, right? The way our embodiment is something that is largely ineffable to us. I do think that there is some form of... of we'll say spiritual transcendence within a human that can happen, uh, an increase in wisdom, a, a metacognizance that is beyond explanation. I've had very many transformative experiences on certain hallucinogenics, and, you know, I have, uh, I have come to see the kind of thing that you talk about and kind of feel it. Now, can I empirically prove some of this stuff? No, but it, it just seems intuitive to me, a lot of what you say, and that's I mean, I've done a lot of research on it. I have no reason, right? I, I, you have to be very careful. A lot of what people, a, a lot of the, the weirdness people think, right? That doesn't, the very, so you have to, you have to wash it to them. my mind. You have to wash out the variation, right? That happen when people's phenomenology, you have to try and I get yeah. what's universal and, and then what's plausible. But the idea that uh, people are, entering into a direct participatory relationship with being and not any particular beings um that they're at the ground that is presupposed mm -hmm. they're at the ground of intelligibility that is presupposed by science and yes. therefore it's not something that science can like i say science can tell us all about the cognition that's going on and why it is plausible that these people and i've made this argument why it's plausible that these people are take are saying things we should take seriously but that doesn't mean that what is disclosed ineffably in these experiences can be put into scientific language because it's at an ontological level deeper than science and presupposed by science. Yeah, yeah, ontologically maybe very different. Um, real quick, I wanted to ask you because I'm having an amazing time, but how long do we have you for? Do you have time 
for maybe a couple of questions from the audience. You could definitely go to, uh, let me see, I could definitely go to 1130 my time. Okay, sure. Yeah, we'll keep going. Um, let's get... Uh, we've got Masha in here. Let's see what she's got to say. Masha, you're coming up. What's going on, Masha? Yes, hi. I have, I have, I have a very important question for yeah. John. Xeris Namila Zelinica. You don't speak no, Greek, No, huh? no. Ah. <laughs> I, 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 okay. So one of the things that might happen this summer is uh, I might be uh, learning ancient Greek. Uh, yeah, I, I, like many philosophers. A worthy yeah, pursuit, yeah, for yeah. sure. If you're trying to look at Platon, I wouldn't do, uh, suggest doing that in English, right? You would just be yet another Westoid, you know, trying to put this very uh, alien perspective on, as you say, there are like geographical, like there are aspects of those philosophies and those philosophers that are very bound, not just by language and geography, but the spirit yeah. of their age yeah. and their culture. Yeah, yeah? I, and, 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 the, and I, I like if I can make it work, um, the, the learning the ancient Greek would actually be done in Greece. Um, so that, that's yeah, a, yeah, at least at least a sort of foundational cup. We'll see. Yeah, I, I, I've committed myself to one way or another. As soon as I retire from UFT, the University of Toronto, I am uh -huh. going to learn uh, ancient Greek. Uh, if I haven't learned it by then. So it, awesome. it's, it, it's, 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 it's definitely on my bucket list. Uh, great, great. I'm just begging you not to write another like West East Divan like Gertha did, oh, no, right? No, like, no, 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 I, 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 I want, like, I don't do this. I, I don't do this individually. I'll, I, I mean, I really hope to go and travel to people that, you know, who speak the mm -hmm. language and are in the culture and, uh, and, and learn from them as much. I want this to be very, very much communally created. Uh, and, and, mm -hmm. I, and I, and I want, I, I'm trying, I mean, I, I prepared myself last year when I went to return to the source and, you know, really got opened up by, um, uh, you, you know, a, a spiritual retreat. I want, I really want to open myself up as much to being transformed by this. Um, so I, I want to share that. I don't want to just be sort of pontificating, like you say, Right? I want to be transformed mm. and challenged and opened up by this project, East and West, um, and share that with people as best I can. May, may I real quick, Great. may I real yeah. quick, Masha, and you're welcome to stay on with us. Um, what are you going to first read in Greek? Are you going to go back to the, like the biblical text or what, what are you going to do? No, I mean, it, once I become competent, I want to read Plato and Plotinus. I, mean, I, already, ha I already have you know, the, the double of translations. Course. And I and I go back as much as I can without knowing the language fully uh, and, and consult people, you know, good commentators around it. Uh, but yeah, that's what I want to read first. Excellent. Good. I mean, I, I have other questions, but I'll allow oh, no, you're, to I mean, ask uh, so much. We can, uh, okay, we got Salman and Brady. Okay, sure, yeah, jump back in the queue. Thank you, Masha. All right, we got Brady on here. Brady, what we got, brother? What's up, Doctor? Thanks for being with us. I'm wondering what you might know about uh, gamma brain waves and super gamma brain waves, and maybe even the breathing techniques that monks use to generate those. Yeah, so uh, I don't know very much about super gamma. Uh, uh, I know about gamma and the idea that what it's uh, the gamma waves, these are EEG uh, uh, brain waves, as people say. Um, um, I, it, the, the evidence, um, and you have to take all of this evidence with a grain of salt. I don't mean I, that doesn't mean dismiss it. You you got to be careful not to try and build too much on it because um, it keeps getting revised um, for good reason. Because uh, you, the degree, the, the depth to which we can measure the the the, the, the resolution we, we can measure, these are all in, uh, changing as we as we're speaking, which is long term a good thing. Uh, but it just means to exercise epistemic caution. Uh, and gamma seems to indicate uh, long-term connections being formed. Um, and 
what needs to be done to my mind to make this start to jump as a science, and, and I, I suspect that maybe some people have done it or are beginning to do it. It needs to be integrated with the work about uh, small world network formation in the brain because um, there's three basic kinds of networks. There's uh, regular networks, which are all local connections. And then there's what's called random, which are a lot of long-term connections. And are we talking about neurons? I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Yeah, we're talking about areas of connectivity, patterns of connectivity in the brain. So you've okay, seen those gotcha. maps where they're drawing all the lines, right? So yeah. that's what I'm talking about. Thanks for that okay. uh, correction. Um, and so a random network has lots of long-term connections. And then you have what's called a small world network, where most of the connections are local, but some of them are long. Now, what's important about all of this, and this comes out of what's called graph science or network theory, um, is um, you have the different networks have different strengths and weaknesses. So, so regular networks are very inefficient. Um, you measure them by what's called mean path distance, the average distance between any two points, number of steps you have to go between any two points on the network. Um, so they are very, uh, very inefficient. Uh, but they're very, they're very, uh, uh, they're very resilient. You can knock out a lot of connections, and the network holds, right? Um, so uh, they can process noise really well for that reason. Um, they, they can process noise polluted data really well. Um, random, very efficient, uh, but uh, really low in, in, in resilience. Uh, you take out one connection, and a whole Part of the network can fall out of the network. Oh. Um, so what you notice is they're in a trade-off relationship. And this is why most people are interested in small world networks is you get sort of the best of both. A small world network is more efficient than a regular network and more resilient than a random network. And so it gives you sort of the best optimality. And this is why the brain... <laughs> can... Sounds like a VPN. Well, what's interesting is like if, if you're unconscious, your brain will break up into a lot of local processing. Yeah. Right. Local regular networks. But when you come into consciousness, it forms uh, a, a fractal sort of small world network. Uh, um. Your brain seeks this out. Now, while that's important, while all of that is important to what was being asked is we, we like it's plausible that what's happening in, when we get gamma is those long term connections are being either made or reinforced. Um, and that could be really important for understanding sort of deeper aspects of consciousness, deeper aspects of insight. Insight is plausibly you have a regular network and you get some moment of criticality that creates a long distance connection, perhaps while you're taking a psychedelic or perhaps just because you've been doing mindfulness. And what happens is the regular network collapses into a small world network. It suddenly gets an increase in efficiency without much loss of resiliency. That's plausibly what's going on in insight. So if we could if we could get clearer on the connections between gamma, long distance connection, insight, consciousness and small world formation, I think that there would be a lot of potential breakthroughs there. So that was a long answer, but um, I thought it was deserving of a, of a long answer. What do you think, Brady? Much appreciated. I'll pass the oh, mic. You're the man. Thank you, sir. Excellent answer, by the way. I love that. Now, Salman, my best friend here, I know he's got a good question. What's up, Salman? What's up? Um, hi, Dr. Verveki. Thank you for talking to us today. My I, pleasure. I have two questions. The first has to do with something you just mentioned earlier about non-procedural knowledge. And you mentioned three Not types. Not propositional. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, non-propositional. And so the, yes. there are three ones, perspectival, procedural, and participatory. Um, yes. So what is, what is the distinction between participatory and procedural? Because they seem to be the same, or maybe they could be just, there might be some distinction that I'm not getting. Sure. So procedural is knowing how to do something, right? Knowing how to ride a bike. Um, mm -hmm. And perspectival is knowing through being conscious. It's about how your how your salience landscaping, knowing what it's oh. like to be you here now in this state of mind, in this situation. So what are you foregrounding? What are you backgrounding? What is standing out for you? What is what are you potentially ignoring? Um, is it suddenly being transformed by an insight? That's perspectival knowing. And allows you to take the perspective of other people. You can empathetically generate for yourself 
what how their salience landscape is likely going. Now, of course, you can't perfectly do that because you can't be their consciousness. You can only be your own consciousness. Consciousness is crucial to perspectival knowing. In fact, I think part of how we explain consciousness is in terms of what's going on in perspectival knowing. So, uh, yeah, perspectival knowing. So a lot of your procedural knowing um, goes on without much involvement of working memory, attention, consciousness, fluid cognition. I, mm-hmm. I should be really clear about this. I don't, I don't like to separate consciousness, attention, working memory, and fluid cognition. They all overlap. They're yes. all defining. They all use the same anatomical areas in the brain. There's yes. good conceptual reasons for distinguishing them, but when we think about it as a causal thing, we should think about them all together. Oh, and that's I think, so well said. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's that's exactly how I think too. So go ahead. Well, well thank you. Um, so um, yeah, that that is very powerfully engaged um, in, in perspectival knowing in a way in which it's not um, engaged. Um, in a lot of our procedural knowing. When you're walking around, it's really, really fringe to your consciousness, what you're doing Mm -hmm. to walk around. Now, that doesn't mean, and by the way, again, these are analytic distinctions. It doesn't mean that these forms of knowing are are not frequently uh, co-active and interacting with each other. You Mm -hmm. can do something that's highly procedural and highly perspectival together, like when I practice Tai Chi Chuan, and, and that is because I'm actually trying to bring about a transformation of my identity, which is at the participatory level. So mm-hmm. if perspectival is, it crucially involves your consciousness above and beyond just your cognition. And um, particip- participatory is different than procedural? Yes. Yeah. That's what he was just uh, getting at. Yeah. yeah, participatory is the kind of knowing that happens through you transforming who, what, your identity, your sense of self. Um, Could I ask a clarifying question that may help someone? Yeah. Um, is it similar to how Bertrand Russell thought of knowledge that, knowledge how, and knowledge by experience? Is it? Is it? Yeah, similar? that would be that. That would be the, that would map on to, to some degree. Although I think Russell, there's, I but I don't want to subject him to an, 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 um, anachronistic criticism. Uh, but I think right, and I, I do know that you mean participa- uh, participatory or is different than what he's saying. I was just, that knowledge by experience part, is that kind knowledge of- Knowledge that is definitely uh, propositional. Knowing how is procedural. Yes. And knowing by experience, I think he's saying something like what I'm trying to say by, and knowledge by acquaintance, right? I think that's what he's trying to say by perspectival. That's that sense of being present, here nowness, togetherness, we're together here now. Being, right? yeah, yeah. But the, the, the participatory knowing is the way you know uh, um, so love, I, I don't want people to identify it, but love is an example of participatory knowing. I know my partner not just by the perspectives I have when I encounter her or my skills that I've developed, my procedural knowledge or the beliefs I have about her. My identity has been changed by her and I, I've internalized that into my identity and that is mm-hmm. how I know her. We have co-shaped each other. We have co-formed each other. We are bound together and we do this with the environment. We do that. We are we are we are co-shaped by physics, by culture, by biology, um, so that what are called affordant this this water bottle is graspable because me and it have been co-shaped by physics and gravity and culture and biology. Well, not so much biology by this, but by culture and and me by biology for this, so that it's graspable for me. It's not graspable by a fly, and my hand can't grasp everything. There's a real relationship, an affordance. Participatory knowing is this process of co-shaping, niche-constructing generation of affordances between you. And th- this is happening in virtue of the, 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 the way you, the, 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 the being of your mind and body. So right, uh, there's all kinds of affordances around you because of the body and mind you have and, and because of the environment and how those have been shaped together the floor is walkable for you because it's been built that way and you're bipedal and that's why we would build it that way and we can build it that way because we've evolved hands yeah. but wood also co-evolved with us and all this stuff right now that doesn't mean you're aware of it or even making use of that affordance but it's there mm-hmm. when i bring that when i make that affordance salient when i bring it into my perspectival awareness then it becomes obvious to me what i should do oh i need to walk now Mm. That's participatory 
the affordance coming into the perspectival, and then you have to engage your skills. Oh, now I walk. This is how I walk. And while you're doing that, you can be changing the evidence for your propositional knowing, changing beliefs. Mm -hmm. that, so that, they're all that, interconnected in some way. Yeah, yes. yes, they are. But they, but they have, but they are asymmetric in their relationships of dependence. Um, uh, so it, it, what I mean by that is the propositional depends on the procedural for its transformation. The procedural depends on the perspectival and so on, all the way down. Mm. That that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, my Someone, other you're question... welcome to stay on with us. Uh, let me look at my caller queue here real quick. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah, Salman, stay on with us if you have another question. Uh, yeah. I need to go get a glass of water because my voice is leaving me. So one okay. second. Go ahead, sure. Salman. Sure. So my other question was, it sounds to me that your, your project about integrating this... Um, the Neoplatonic tradition with the Zen tradition and you wanting to travel around the world, it sounds like it's a inherently a spiritual one. Spirituality seems to be a, a core um, value that you that you see. Yes. So I, my yes. question is, what is the significance for spirituality for us humans? Why do we need spirituality? You need spirituality because... Um, what, uh, <laughs> I'm laughing not because I uh, you at all. I'm laughing at myself because uh, that that was basically what I tried to ar uh, argue in the 50 episodes of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And so mm -hmm. I'm trying to think in my mind how can I uh, shrink that argument down right here, right now. Um, here's how I'll do it. We have. Uh, I'm just going to say something for which I I and others have a lot of argument, a lot of evidence. It's we should stop of thinking of, about the mind as in here. And think about the mind as between between brain body and between brain body and world dynamically mm -hmm. dynamically coupled self-organizing right at all those levels i was just talking about the participatory the perspectival uh, the procedural the uh, propositional mm -hmm. okay now that that self-organizing dynamic it's it's largely trying i would argue it's largely trying to do it's it's helping you solve two meta problems these are problems you have to solve when you want to try to solve any of your other problems. Um, the first is what I call relevance realization, which is out of all of the information available to me, how do I zero in on the relevant information? Oh, yes. And, it, and this is what you can't do. You can't check all the information to see it's, if it's relevant or not because it's mm -hmm. combinatorial explosive, right? So somehow you have to intelligently ignore. And that means, right, that means that this act of relevance realization isn't cold calculation. It's it's affectively laden. It's what you find salient. Salient. It's what draws your attention. It's what arouses you metabolically. It's what makes you com commit your risky, and you know, precious cognitive and temporal resources to this rather than mm -hmm. that. It's a fundamental kind of caring. Right. Yes. That's one. And then the other is you want to anticipate the world rather than just react to it. And that's yes. and that's that's called out with predictive processing. I won't get into the I won't get into the depths of this. We just published a paper last year in the Journal of uh, Phenomenology and the Cognitive Sciences, integrating relevance realization theory and predictive processing theory together. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'll point you to that if you want to get the scientific details about this. So you get this basic thing in which you are in the, you're caring about the world and you're caring about this world in this prospective fashion, and you're doing this relevance realization. Now, the problem with all of that is it's wonderfully adaptive and it also makes you com continuously prone to self-deception. Yes. Because mm -hmm. you're, you're, focusing on, you're focusing on this and you're building a predictive model and that makes you ignore all of this and it means you might react. That sounds a bit like the coherence theory of truth. Um, I would say it's the aletheic theory of truth. Um, oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, mm -hmm. And so the point I'm trying to make is that the very processes that make us so adaptive by binding us to this world, by this caring connectedness, I use the word religio because it has that, that's what the word means. It means to be bound, to be connected, right? That, those processes that bind us do, right? They also make us continually prone to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes. So... What do we want to do? Do we want to shut off these processes to avoid the self-deception? Well, that's not going to work. We need these processes. So what we, we need, need some to do self, is we need self-correction mechanism. We need a self-correction mechanism 
that deals not with ignorance, but with foolishness, how we deceive ourselves. And it has to work in a way that it not only helps us ameliorate the self-deception, but enhances the sense of connectedness to ourselves, to other people, to the world. And it has to work not just propositionally, but procedurally and perspective. It has to transform not only my beliefs, it has to transform my skills, it has to transform my states of mind, it has to transform my traits of character. It has to cultivate virtue and put me in the project of aspiring to more and more wisdom, because wisdom is what you get to overcome foolishness. I think the aspiration to wisdom and virtue that is directed at enhancing meaning in life a sense of connectedness because that's what meaning in life is your sense of connectedness to something mm -hmm. to mattering to something other than yourself that's spirituality it is the wise cultivation of connectedness hmm. yeah, that's well said that's I well like said it. thank you sir okay, well said. thank you someone anybody else please uh, we're having a good time with our friend up here hohenheim i'd love to hear from you if you want to call up here and ask uh, dr john anything Peter, I'd love to hear from you. Guys, call in. Don't be scared. John's nice. He's very nice. I hope so. <laughs> oh, okay. we have our friend. We call him the Nevekian unit. Uh, let's see what he's got for us. What's up, Nevik? What you got on your mind, buddy? Uh, hi. Hi. How are you? Um, I, I was wondering... Uh, on meaning, do you think that it's about what people create, or do you think people have a purpose and they have to find that purpose? Yeah, I think that's a good question because it, it, it affords me sort of clarifying some things. I don't talk about the meaning of life um, I, because I don't think there is such a thing. I don't think there is a purpose to be found written into the cosmos in some fashion. I, agree. I think there is, I think there is meaning of life. Uh, sorry, there is no meaning of life. I think there's meaning in life. Meaning in life, and and this, and I do psychological work on this, and a lot of people do. There's experimental work. There's good theoretical debate. This is a bona fide thing. Uh, meaning in life is, um, it's made up of a of, of a bunch of dimensions. One is uh, like a, a sort of perspectival coherence. So. You're not facing absurdity because the cosmic perspective and your own individual perspective are clashing with each other. There's a there's a, a sense of mattering. You're connected to something that has a reality and an existence uh, and a value independent of your existence and your valuing. So one of the ways you can ask people uh, what gives them meaning in life is what would you want to exist even if you ceased existing? Oh, um, all the music okay. I love. Right. Okay. That's, that's the first connection. And the first question, the second question is how much do you matter to it? How much connected are you to it? How much do you make a difference to its existence, uh, its beauty in the world? Right. Um, uh. Now, and, there, and, and then there's how real it is that you're connected to. So basically, like I said, the sense of connectedness to yourself, to each other in the world. Now, connectedness is not something you can make. That's that's a, right. Connectedness is a real relation that you can participate in. You know, to be connected from reality, it all, it, you can't just impose it on reality. It has to be something that is receptive to what how reality is co-creating with you this relationship. Remember, the affordance. Is the graspability of this in this? Nope. Is it in my hand? No. It's in the real connectedness, the real relationship between it. Yeah. Meaning yeah. is the affordance of intelligibility, is, is the affordance of cognition. Um, and so uh, there's a good Latin word for this that we don't have anymore. Uh, we don't have, sorry, we don't have an English equivalent. It's called inventio. Inventio means both to discover and to make. And it points to this participation. Do you make your relationship with your loved one, with your partner? No. Do you discover it? That's not right. You co-create it together by generating a real relationship that takes on a life of its own. When yeah. people are in a loving relationship, they not only love each other, they love the relationship they're in. That's predictive of the longevity of the relationship, right? And so you have meaning is something you and the environment, which can be other people, can be the physical, the, sorry, the ecological environment, you co-create together, you participate in it. And 
and, and I think that's uh, the right way of thinking about it. I talk about this as meaning is neither an, a sub, purely subjective phenomena or a purely objective phenomena, it's transjective. It's about the real relationships that bind the subjective objective world together. Yes, I agree with that. I, I t yes. Um, Nivik, did that answer you, buddy? Yeah, I, 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 I like I, I I get where he's coming from. It's kind of like um, meaning can be something that is very sentimental, and it could be it could be something like uh, having uh, more of an understanding. <laughs> Yeah, but I want you to try and think about meaning. I mean, it, and they are deeply related. The way you should think about truth is, like, if you think of truth as something just in you or just in the world, you're missing what truth is. Truth is the proper binding of you and the world together. But truth depends on the previous binding of meaning. If I ask you, even at a propositional level, is it true that giggle flips frequently bip bop? You don't know if it's true or false because you don't know what it means. The meaning relation has to be there in, in order for the truth relation to be there. And by the way, this is not a correspondence theory of truth. This is an aletheric theory of truth. There has to be some binding of the subjective and objective together that makes the correspondence possible or makes the coherence possible. And yeah. again, uh, I have lots of argument about that. Heidegger built a career around it. Um, I'm, I'm just pointing at it and asking you to trust me that there's good argument and good philosophy around that claim. Yes. Nivik, that was awesome, brother. Who we got left? Who we got? Okay. But we're going to let Brady on one more time, and then we're going to let John go because he's been nice and stayed with us over time. Unless, John, you want to – anything else you want to bring up? I mean, I'll sit here and be quiet and listen to you talk about the meaning crisis all day. I love it. No, 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 no. no. That's fine. I, uh, I don't want to overstay my welcome. No, you don't. You have not overstayed your welcome. I'm just saying we're – Callers are, are, are how, what's the word? They're shy. You know what I mean? Uh, I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover with you, but I can always come up with better questions. Um, let's take Brady on one more time and see what he's got, and then we'll go from there. What's up, Brady? Then we'll go from there. What's up, Brady? Yeah, two quick ones. I got a hardball and a softball. The hardball one is um, can you confirm or deny the legitimacy of the work people are doing with random number generators in consciousness? And then yeah, the, uh, the softball yeah. one. Yeah, go ahead yeah, with that yeah. one. Let's, uh, can, yeah, I'm just asking if we can answer them sequentially so I don't get mixed up. Um, so I, I've seen some of this. I've seen a lot of related stuff. I was at a conference on uh, subtle body work um, in, um, in, in what was it September, I think. Uh, no, it was January, sorry. Um, and what I can say is, uh, first of all, a lot of the, you have to pare things away. There, and you know this, so I don't, but I just want to remind, a lot of this is bullshit charlatans, right? And they have to be pared away. And, you know, Randy yeah. did, you know, did yeah. a lot of work just getting rid of that. Okay, so yes, let's say, let's take it away. And so one of the, one, uh, uh, right? But I've met people who are doing um, very careful science, um, in that they were taking every possible uh, criticism or content from skeptics and then building it into their experimental design. However, they had two. So I take them to be good, doing good faith science and they were getting results. However, I had three major criticisms of that work. Uh, one was they need to have a, a very trained and skilled stage magician in there uh, when things are happening. Um, and secondly, um, the, well, so, so secondly, the, the end. Uh, in these experiments is too low, um, which is part of the problem with a lot of the research. We need really, really big N. Uh, we need to be making very sure that people aren't tricking us. And then finally, uh, we have to keep the goalposts very, very stable. Uh, we can't fudge the goalposts so that we can pee hack or we can hark. Um, I think there are people I'm trying to, uh, I'm going to give you a, a, an answer you're going to find dissatisfactory. Uh, but what I can say is I think there are people who are in good faith trying to do very good science, but I don't think these standards have been yet properly addressed so that we can um, agree that something has been uh, established. Uh, established. Pardon me? I was just thinking. Pardon me? 
Uh, it's really interesting you say that because I was just thinking about the baby chick experiment and how they may have designed the table to uh, maybe lean one direction, whichever whichever side the baby chicks are on, like maybe the weight of the baby chicks are leaning the table in that yeah. direction. But this experiment can be easily replicated at home with some baby chicks and a very simple robot. And so I encourage people to try it themselves if they ever, you know, uh, hmm. feel bored or something. <laughs> um, it's a cool experiment to, to run. And the, the softball question at the end is if you have any effective coping mechanisms for psycho. Actually, Br Brady, thank you for asking that because, uh, Dr. John, I'm bipolar type one manic. So I've been in psychosis before. I'd like to hear your take on that. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so in, in, you're in psychosis, um, you're overfitting, right? And you're, you're, you're finding connections that aren't really there. Um, and so practices that bring you uh, down to a lower level of construal, um, especially in mindfulness, moving, moving mindfulness practices that emphasize embodiment like Tai Chi, yoga, um, uh, can help um, dialogical practices uh, can help because uh, um, people generally get better if they are with participating in distributed cognition on their reality checking um, the reality sourcing there's there's things you need to also do supplementary right you need to make sure that um, you can change your environmental context uh, to one uh, that has more regular, reliable patterns in it. Uh, you want to reduce noise in your environment a lot. Um, and you want to reduce noise in your head a lot because what you're, what's happening in psychosis is that noise is being reinterpreted as meaning. And so things you can do psychologically, cognitively, things you can do environmentally, things you can do socially so that you are getting you're reducing noise, you're increasing clear signal, you're increasing the way you are bound to yourself, bound to other people, uh, bound to the world. Uh, these can all help. Now, of course, that they won't work if your psychosis is being driven, you know, uh, chemically or biologically because you've got a brain tumor or, or there's something massively going wrong with your endocrine system or, or, or you're, you're in a fever and you don't realize it, you know. Delirium. So, I, I mean, I say all those in the context of you've you've got a lot you've done a lot to do physiological stability, and then like I say, you do environmental stabilization. You get you, as much as you can get noise out of the system, all the systems uh, in all those dimensions, and get a sense of connectedness that's very concrete, very specific, very low level, not high level abstraction. Uh, then that can help. I agree with that. <clears throat> Especially the last part you said with the low level abstraction. Uh, yes, yeah, something to touch almost, right? In a metaphor. Yeah, sense. And, and, and you, and you want to be able to, like, like um, you want to externalize what's, as long as you're ruminating. But, like, this is for, dep I'm using an analogy from depression, right? Right. Uh, when you ruminate, it tends to make things, when you do it in your head, when you write it out, it tends to reduce because you, you get to that third person perspective because you're writing. That doesn't necessarily work for psychosis because people can write. No. Or, or they're weird, right? No. But I'm using, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to be clear. I was using that as an analogy. But the reason.